A new episode of The Ripple Drop, some updates on the XRP Ledger issues we've seen over the past day or so. We've got some commentary coming out of the Investor Advisory Committee meeting that was held by the SEC today, and two Ripple partnerships that you should know about. If we haven't met before, my name is Frank Cho. I'm here to help you live a richer life, and on this channel, we talk about cryptocurrency, personal finance, and investing. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, do it now. That way, I can keep you informed of all the latest news and updates. Hit a like if you find any value here in this video, and don't forget to enter our 25,000 subscriber giveaway. Link Linked in the video description down below. Now let's take a quick look at the crypto market before we dive right in. We're a little red today, down 1% to 2.61 trillion. Bitcoin is at uh, 57,000. Ethereum, 4,500. XRP, slightly under a dollar. And Cardano is recovering up 10% on the day, while Solana is up another 5%, now up 12% on the week. So some interesting movements in the top 10 cryptos. Now, Ripple had their Apex Developer Summit recently. Uh, to attend, you needed to be a developer for the XRP Ledger. But they posted the latest video of the Ripple drop on the official Ripple YouTube channel, where they talk about what happened in the summit. So I will link that down below because uh, it's about 12 minutes long. It's worth listening in on. You can see what was happening there and there's a few good conversations. This is something I always highly encourage you to listen in on because they have a really good uh, production value as far as how they've put this video together. They actually have a real camera crew and uh, great lighting and all that good stuff, but they also uh, engage in those topics and you don't want to really miss out on some of the little nuances in there. So check it out. I'll link it down in the video below. If you are interested in me you know going through it in more detail i certainly can as well just let me know in the comments if i get enough interest maybe i can do a video on that over the weekend now uh speaking of the video here and the weekend let me just give you a quick update i am uh constrained for time on thursday so going forward expect the thursday videos to be a little bit shorter than normal today is thursday and so this will be a little bit briefer than maybe we're accustomed to and going forward expect that so it'll probably clock in around that 10 minute mark versus our normal slightly longer uh, videos now, over the course of this weekend, I do hope to put out a video regarding the Reeves test because that was something I had seen several people comment on. And so I will try and dive into that and do a little bit more of a deep dive into that because I think it is valuable to understand. You know, we have a pretty clear understanding of what the Howey test is, but the Reeves test is a little different. So maybe we should talk about that. So stay tuned and make sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss that one coming up very soon once I can put that together. Now let's look at the update on the XRP ledger. So this is posted here on the uh, Ripple X dev site. Uh, I'll link this down below so you can read through it in more detail and see some of the additional commentary. But this is the update over uh, what's been happening with the XRP ledger. I know there's been some confusion, there's been some issues, but let's talk about it. So over the past several weeks, the XRP ledger has experienced instability, a transient halt in consensus on November 3rd and over the last several hours prior to this publication, which just happened yesterday when we were really seeing those issues. Uh, unusually high fees resulting in a large queue of transactions. The XRP Ledger Foundation summarized many of these in a recent communication. You can follow that link to see more there. Essentially, the number of trust lines, tokens, and transactions on the network has increased dramatically, and the size of the ledger state has grown. So there is a corresponding need to scale to this growth that the community is now addressing. Despite these challenges, the XRP ledger is continuing to make forward progress because of the hard work of a number of dedicated ecosystem participants, such as the XRP Ledger Foundation. In parallel, many in the XRPL community, including Ripple, are working to more thoroughly understand the issues and propose to the best path forward. So actions towards a solution. Since 2013, Ripple, along with others in the community, has contributed improvements to various components of the XRP ledger and related technology, including on components such as RippleD and XRPL.js. This team has submitted proposed enhancements to the performance of the code base that, after approval by the broader community, have already been adopted, including a set 
of changes that dramatically reduce the memory usage for servers. Those fixes are already helping the network cope with the increased load. Prior to this recent instability, though, engineers were already working on several proposed changes that should help improve the scalability and performance of the ledger. But the events of the past few weeks have caused us to redouble our efforts in the weeks ahead. Our team will continue to work hard to identify performance bottlenecks and propose targeted improvements to fix things. So keep in mind, this is coming from Elliot Lee uh, of Ripple X. Some of the things that are going to uh, be proposed one, making it easier to run Rippled in reporting mode, which is a special mode that's tailored to handling the RPC and WebSocket client requests outside of the main Rippled process and can scale horizontally, making it possible to service more clients more efficiently. Working on Project Clio, which was re uh, presented at a Apex, the conference we were just talking about, the dev conference, and is being designed to efficiently service RPC and WebSocket client requests. Three, building profile guided improvements that help eliminate lock contention, avoid resource starvation, and enhance I.O. performance, all of which should make servers perform better at higher loads, which is going to be very important, especially with all these other projects uh, that we've seen with all the new trust lines that are being established with, uh, you've got XR Doge as an example, XR uh, Shib, XR Moon, or X Moon. you get just on and on and on, so many that it's bogging down the system. Uh, proposing several protocol level improvements, including changes to the binary representation of some objects like trust lines, which should result in significant additional memory savings, reduced overhead, lower bandwidth usage, faster sync times, and less memory pressure for servers. And then finally, he ends here with a call to action. The XRPL is open source. Uh, it's a shared resource and no party is responsible for it. Several participants in the community have already stepped up with many going above and beyond. He says, we at Ripple are also focusing engineering efforts on understanding and solving the issues. But as with everything on the ledger, it requires community effort. And so they are calling on everyone in the XRPL community to contribute to the solution. Numerous exchanges and other participants use the XRP ledger. So they're also calling on them to operate infrastructure that supports the network with the same care and diligence that they use in operating their other production environments. And he says, finally, we believe the issues related to the rapid growth of the XRP ledger are transient and will, with the help of the broader community, will be solved so that the ledger will continue to get stronger as it grows. So there you have it. Just one voice out of many speaking about what's happening, issues and constraints. It will take some work to get things fully uh, capable to handle these new loads. As you can see, there's work in progress, but more to come. I'll keep you posted on updates I find out here as they uh, make the headlines. Now, there was earlier today the Investor Advisory Committee of the SEC, which we did talk about yesterday as happening. I was unable to attend today. It would have been good to hear, but we do have friends in the community that have been able to listen in and post some clips. So JV, who's a great source, he runs a great po uh, podcast too on Spotify. Uh, you should check him out. Follow him on Twitter at JV the Great. Uh, he has posted numerous clips here of the event, and I want to key in on one that I thought was really interesting. So let's take a listen into that here in just a second. But uh, before we do that, just note that you had multiple perspectives coming out of this event. You had some people pro, some people against. Uh, you can see there were numerous panelists, there were industry representatives. So we've got lots of voices being heard. But let's listen to one. This is something that I haven't really heard about as much. And so I think it's worth uh, hearing this perspective. So let's listen in real quick here. Not just register as securities. Why the resistance? I mean, I feel like your profit margin should be able to bear such a thing to, in order to bring all of the benefits that registration comes. And if you think it's inappropriate, what are the protections that are afforded by securities registration that you think investors should not have? I'd, I'd love to hear which protections you think are, are not appropriate. Is it is it Reg BI? Is it is it best interest? Is it best execution? Like, what are the protections you think are inappropriate? So an interesting voice there. She's really bringing into question, you know, people are not wanting to register as securities. So she's saying, what investor protections are you against? This is a very uh, pro-SEC standpoint. So yes, there are numerous protections afforded to securities, which make a lot of sense if 
you are offering a security. The reason why firms aren't wanting to register as securities is because the product is not a security. Uh, and I think that that's the thing that's being missed in this part of the discussion by her, at least, is that the products, so we'll just take one for example, XRP. XRP is not a security in Ripple, the company, right? You do not have an investment contract with Ripple, the company. And so because that does not exist, what is the security? That There isn't a security there. There's no securitized token, uh, right? Because you're not benefiting from the profits of Ripple, the company. You're not getting a payout or distribution from Ripple's financials. So even if you were thinking about registering something uh, with the SEC, um, there's no correlation there. They're not tied or connected to one another. So with the financial performance of Ripple, the company is not going to have a direct impact on XRP's price. And as we've seen and talked about many times on the channel, uh, the correlation is higher with Bitcoin than with the performance of Ripple as a company because Ripple has actually been pretty successful in building out further uh, products and services overseas, but we haven't seen that really translate into price for XRP. Why? Because it's more correlated with the crypto market. Ripple, the company itself, should see some big growth here, especially if they can get through all the SEC mess uh, and make it to where they can list publicly because of all these new partnerships that they have built, uh, especially overseas. And then hopefully once this is resolved, even more so here in the US. But speaking of overseas partnerships for Ripple, let's turn the page here for a second. So Payporter has opened up a partnership with Ripple for uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, Sudan, Kenya, Nigeria, and Pakistan for uh, inexpensive cross-border payments here, remittances um, that will open up new corridors. And then also you have uh, Uniteller partnering with uh, Tranglo, who Ripple has a 40% stake in, we've talked about before, but this will expand services in 13 Asia markets, including uh, Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, and Nepal. So there will be more than 58,000 cash pickup points, more than 1,100 account deposit banks and 90 wallet platforms uh, that are going to be added to their network. So you can see these uh, partnerships, especially overseas, uh, continuing to become more robust to have uh, increased reach into countries where they weren't even operating yet. So these will continue. Uh, my hope my desire, my wish here is that in the U.S. we can get our act together on the regulatory side and really uh, find some common ground, get some sort of, if it's not a settlement, some sort of uh, decision out of the court that will at least allow the businesses to operate and participate in this new technology. We're missing out on the growth that we're seeing in other places. And so it's really sad to see that play out here with the US SEC. But hopefully we can get past it sooner rather than later because these partnerships are in place. And once you add the remittance corridors to the US, it will really help proliferate the technology, expand the use case, and help, of course, for the investors who are tied in with XRP, the token, not Ripple, the company. Uh, but you'll see some gains there as the utilization, the transaction volume, all that goes up, the demand, while that supply is still constrained to a fixed amount uh, with those timed releases from escrow. I hope this information was helpful for you. If it was, make sure that you hit that subscribe button so I can keep you informed of future news and updates. Don't forget to hit that like button if you found any value here and enter the 25,000 subscriber giveaway. I hope that you have a fantastic start to your weekend as we get into Friday tomorrow. I am looking forward to it. I thank you very much for spending just a short period of time here with me, and I will see you in the next one.